share with you through the Ministry of Compassion this morning. Um, it's really an honor and a blessing to be able to be here with you and, and just worship with you uh, this morning. So before I start, I'd love to just say that this is a ministry that I'm so passionate about. And just to clear the table right away, um, because I know that there's kind of this uneasy thought about humanitarian organizations, is it's not really the organization that I'm excited about, but it's the church. And so I'm going to talk a little bit later about how compassion works um, and why I'm excited about the church. Um, but firstly, I'd love to just pray with you um, and just commit this time to the Lord um, as we seek his leading um, and as we, as we listen to his voice this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for um, just allowing us to be in your presence this morning, uh, to worship you through song and to worship you in this place through our lives, God. God, I just thank you for the opportunity that lies before us this morning. And God, we just pray that as uh, your church rises up um, to be the hands and feet of Jesus in so many different capacities, Lord, um, I just pray that, that those hands and those feet would be honoring to you and that those hands and those feet would be what you use um, to create change in this world uh, in Jesus' name, Lord. God, what if, what if your church in this generation will rise up? What if we would take that baton and we would go to all the four corners of this world preaching your, your name? Uh, would this reality of poverty be nothing but a distant memory, God? I just pray that you'd use our hands and feet this morning um, to make it a distant reality, Lord. And God, we just thank you for, for you and for what you're about to do in this place. In your name, amen. So on Tuesday, I got back from Nicaragua. I was there visiting the work of Compassion and, um, and what they're doing there in Nicaragua to help uh, the children who are living in poverty and help the families living in poverty. And what I experienced there was a storm. A storm of desperation. Walking through some of these streets and just seeing utter despair, hopelessness, breathlessness, people who live in, in this reality with absolutely no hope. And so as we walked through these communities and walked into these homes and saw um, just the despair and the reality that some of these people are living in, we saw hopelessness. But indeed we saw hope. We saw people who are living in desperation but crying out to a God who can rescue them from their desperation. And you know, I think that sometimes we as the church forget who God is. And we forget who Jesus is. And we forget that he is a God who's working miracles yesterday, today, and forever. And we lack faith. You know, we get into these difficult situations and we forget because we live in a culture where we can just run to so many different things for hope and for joy. But we forget that God is our source of strength and God is our source of joy. And he will be there through, with us through every storm that we face in this life. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 8, verses 23 through 27. <laughs> So this is a story of Jesus calming the storm. And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves. But Jesus was asleep. And they went and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? 
Then he rose and rebuked the winds and the seas, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this that even the winds and the seas would obey him? It's Holy Spirit. So I just want you to just kind of grasp this for a minute. Um, if you know the, the this sea that they were on, you'll know that this sea is surrounded by mountains. And so when the winds come in, it just causes this huge current. And these waves are, are huge. I mean, the disciples had good reason to be afraid. But you have to remember, the disciples are Jesus' followers. These guys have been traveling with Jesus for a while now. And they've already seen Jesus work miracles. But they get caught up in this storm this huge storm, this desperation, and they forget that they are with the God who created the winds, the God who created the waves, and the God who has the power to silence the storm. And so Jesus looks to, him, looks to them and he says, Oh, you of little faith. And I look back on my own life and I think, how many times have I been in this similar storm and forgotten that the God that I serve is the one who can calm it? He's the one who can calm it. And so there was this lack of faith in the disciples, and there's a lack of faith in our Christian culture today, here in Canada um, and around the world. So I want to share with you a story, um, a story of faith, um, of a pastor a pastor in Peru. So this pastor went to Peru because he felt called by God to a very specific community there. A community that was broken and in need of a savior. And the thing is, in the third world, there's so many pastors who are passionate about releasing people from poverty, but they have no resources whatsoever. They go there with nothing but the gospel. That's, that's really hard, uh, very hard, because we here are able to rely on our offerings and donations and support through the church, but the people that go to these churches, they have nothing to give but themselves. And so this pastor goes to this community trusting that God is going to help him reach out to this community. And so for three years, he would walk to church running because there were people who just threw things at him. Uh, tomatoes, garbage. They didn't want him there because he was a man who was saying, I can help you. I'm here to help you, but he had nothing to give. Um, and the community was turning to somebody who had nothing but Jesus, and they didn't understand, well, if you have Jesus, why is your life like this? You know, Why do you have nothing to give um, but Jesus? And so his church started out with about 10, 20 people. The pastor was getting discouraged. And then compassion came along and partnered with the pastor to reach out to the community. And so this is a beautiful thing about compassion, is compassion's not about compassion. Compassion's not about a name. Compassion's not about a face. But compassion is about Jesus, and they're about the church. And so what compassion does is they partner with the local church in the third world. And the child sponsorship sponsors each individual child that attends the Compassion Program. And so what we're seeing is, is that people from Canada and people from the United States and the UK sponsor a child so that they can stay in the program. And what's happening is these children are being shared the gospel. They're receiving a meal every single day. They're getting clothes on their back, food in their stomachs, and they're receiving Jesus and education. And what we're seeing is that these children, when they receive Jesus, they go back to their homes changed, and they reach out to their families, and their families reach out to the community. And we're seeing this ripple effect of communities in the third world changing because somebody decided, I'm going to save the life of one child. And that's the business that Jesus was in. Jesus was in the business of reaching out to individual souls. 
And that's the business that we're in as well. So Jesus calmed the storm. And the disciples uh, were in awe. So I want to encourage you for just a moment to look back on the biggest storm that you've ever faced in life. And ask yourself, how is my faith in that moment? So we're just going to move on back to a passage here. Matthew 8, 5 through 13. When he had entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him, appealing to him, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And he said to him, I will come and heal him. That's Jesus speaking. But the centurion replied, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. And when Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, so his disciples and the rest of the crowd, Truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. And I tell you, many will come from the east and the west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown out into utter darkness, into that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So I read this, the, little, the latter part of that passage just to say how important faith is to the Lord and how the faith of this centurion um, when he came to Jesus knowing very well and not only knowing but believing that Jesus could, could heal, um, heal his servant. And I love the picture that this represents because the centurion came on behalf of his servant. He says that his servant is lying, paralyzed, helpless, hopeless. And he knows that he's able to go on his behalf and to plead to the Lord Jesus to rescue him. I love the picture that it represents because it's, it represents so much of us being capable and able to go on someone's behalf and reach out to them and share the gospel with them, rescue them from hopelessness. I remember the first time I read this, I just thought back to the many concerts that I attended and the many times that I had the, the capability to release a child from poverty, but how many times I said no. And so I say that today not to guilt anyone into sponsoring a child or anything like that, but just to say that as we sit here today, don't say, but I already do this and I already do that. Let's ask ourselves the question, do I have anything left to give? Because as we walk around this world and as we say, do I have anything left to give? The Lord Jesus is going to start to use us in miraculous ways as we step out in faith and as we rescue people from poverty. So two Februarys ago I was... Um, standing at a church in Dominican Republic uh, with a pastor and he shared a very similar story to the pastor in Peru of the story I just told you. And it was interesting because as we stood there with him, uh, he, he said to us, I'd love to just pray with you. And I'm thinking like, whoa, like we're a group of people coming over from Canada and he wants to pray with us. You know, like we, we should be praying for him and with him. Um, but before he prayed, he, he shared these words. He said, when I came here to this community, I had a passion to see this community come to know Jesus. And he said, and I had dreams, dreams that God would, would cause that change. But very quickly those dreams became nightmares. My church was shrinking. My walls were collapsing. Um, 
But then he said, then we partnered with Compassion. And now we have 400 children who are in our program and over a thousand people in our church. And it's all because people in the first world decided, I'm going to step out and I'm going to sponsor a child. And it's interesting how, as children are enrolled in the program, not only the program grows, but the church itself grows. Because people don't see compassion. They see the church. They see the pastor. They see the, tr- the staff at the church. People that live in their communities, that know the needs of their communities. For compassion, it's not about going to these countries and building wells because we know that that needs already taken care of by so many other organizations that are doing that very thing. We want to see children come to know Jesus and that's what compassion's all about. And we've seen children growing up and going to university and then going back to their own communities and making a huge difference in their communities. As the kids look up to them, they see somebody who was released from poverty and who's now just reaching out into that same poverty. Um, And it's interesting because we've actually had some cases where we've been able to close down projects because there's no need in that community anymore. Jesus is doing a miraculous work in some of these communities. And so, as I stand here with you today, um, I want to ask you, do you have anything left to give? Um, And as you ponder that, um, you can watch this video. The, f- the first uh, child that I sponsored, and I remember just this, this idea of being the one in Jesus called to reach out um, and to be his hands and feet. And I've heard so many people say it before that I, I can't or, um, or I won't. And it's funny how when Jesus went up into heaven, in a sense, he passed the baton onto us. And he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Baptize people in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And that's what this is to me. Um, It's the opportunity to make a difference in the life of a very individual, very specific child. And to see that child go into all the world and preach the gospel in their very own community. Um, And it's interesting because we've seen that, we've seen that happening. And the same God who calmed the storm is the same God who healed the dying servant. And he's the same God who lives in each and every one of us. It's pretty powerful to think that the same God who's manifested in each and every one of our lives is the same God who's going to be the one to save this world from poverty and to save this world from brokenness. And as I walked on these streets, these impoverished streets, I thought, you know, what an opportunity we have. Because as each and every one of these children were dying in hopelessness, and as each and every one of these mothers living in a run-down shed, and as each and every one of these pastors are serving on streets of brokenness, we know that beyond a shadow of a doubt, that the God that is now living in their lives is the same God who's going to give hope to the children. He's the same God who's going to turn their homes into mansions. And he's the same God who's going to allow them to walk on streets of gold. And that's true change. These people may live in poverty for the rest of their lives, but the reality is, is now they have a church that is pouring into them. And that's their family. You know? Like, this is the great commission. It's the great, it's the great commandment. It's a beautiful thing to see the church rising up to make a difference. And I just wanted to share um, just a little letter that a sponsor wrote after she went to visit her sponsor child. But what I'd love everybody to do is if you could close your eyes and picture yourself 
in this moment. Picture yourself as this woman who wrote this. Today I met a young man who will become the sacrifice for his family's well-being. It's heavy, right? It was heavy to enter into, but stay with me on this. His name is Marlo. He is in his third year of high school. He has three siblings, an older brother who is deaf and mute, a sister, and a younger brother who is also deaf and mute. Four years ago, their parents were killed in a horrific traffic accident. The children came under the care of their grandparents. The grandmother is sick, and she accepts it. She almost welcomes it. As she spoke of the accident between teary-eyed pauses, you could see her hurt. You could also feel it. It was her daughter that was killed. I'm not trying to be poetic or dramatic when I say this, but death broke this family. It especially broke the two boys who are deaf and mute. Depression was as much of a guest at their house as we were. You can tell the grandmother has lived in countless hours of immeasurable loss, immeasurable questions. She looks up, always pausing to look up. It's like she's just ready. And then she says it. I'm ready to go be with my daughter. Behind her stands Marlo, listening to the story of all their sorrow, his sorrow. She calls Marlo into the conversation and with comfort explains, We are training him to care for the siblings because we will not be here much longer. We have him administrate the medications. He takes the boys to the compassion center. He needs to graduate high school and get a job and be here for his brothers and sisters. Marlo looks up at us and he knows. He knows he's becoming a man. And in so many ways, he's their sacrificial lamb. The grandmother, she says, he has to do these things so that they can have a life. I can see the responsibility weigh heavy on him, heavy and impossible. We ask him how he is, and he simply responds, I am grateful my grandparents are still here to help. Marlowe's brothers, who are deaf and mute, are in the child sponsorship program. They have sponsors who write them, who love them, who pour into them. And the tutors have walked with this family through this horrific event. She knows every detail of their story, and she sees them every single week at their home. But Marlo, he's not in the program. In the Dominican Republic, we generally only bring in one child per family unless the circumstances are dire. So knowing that both deaf and mute brothers are sponsored shows how much need this family is in. I keep trying to catch Marlo's eyes like maybe I can pour hope into him with just a glance. He looks everywhere, but not steady into our eyes. And all my prayers and my thoughts and my questions start, but I can't wrap them up. Open-ended, it all feels so devastatingly open-ended. Then there's Jonathan, who works for Compassion in Dominican Republic. Jonathan, who is Dominican, who once was a sponsor child. He pulls Marlo aside as we're leaving. It's like he could hear my questions. It's like he was asking the same ones. He looks him long and hard in his eyes and he speaks to him. We pile into the bus, heavy. Our hearts are heavy and swollen with questions. Hope collided with the heavy reality. Compassion is there. That's hope. Marlo's dreams are now wrapped up around his family's survival. That's heavy. The church knows the family and visits the family. That's hope. And Jonathan looks at me and he says, It was heavy, right? He says it like he's trying to grasp it too. When I pulled Marlo aside, I spoke to him as a man. I encouraged him. And I'm going to start to mentor him one-on-one. -on -one. I'm going to be here for him through everything. And my swollen heart dives into that deep breath. Yeah, I think Jonathan is here for him. The church is here for him. This is why compassion works only through the local church. Because I'm going to leave. And all other groups that come, they'll leave too. I look back as we drive away from Marlo's home. Marlo stays, I leave. I look back again and I see the church where the Compassion Center is. The church stays, hope. This world, it's broken. So Marlo will carry his cross, a cross that Jesus knows well, one that God will not let him carry alone. When it's between life and death, 
when it's between a man that will become the sacrifice for his family. Can we just agree that $41 a month and the opportunity to write letters to a child and maybe even visit your child someday is so worth it? So the church stays. That's powerful. It's very powerful. So I, earlier I asked this question. How is God going to defeat poverty in the world? You might laugh when I say this, but it's not about Compassion Canada. The answer is the church. We are the church. And we need to be the hands and feet that God has indeed called us to be. So there's a bunch of children at the back that don't have sponsors. Um, and this is one of the boys here. Um, so take the opportunity to go to the back and take a look. Um, and if God's leading you to, to sponsor, there's so many kids back that they're in need of a sponsor. And I know that each and every one of us, um, especially if we're feeling called this morning, um, can change the life of a child forever. I'd just like to close with a song that I wrote.